Welcome back to How to Fix Democracy, our fifth series. We are recording in person in Washington, D.C. from the wonderful Bertelsmann offices. It's always nice to do it in person in a post-COVID world. Uh, this fifth series is focusing on 100 years of American democracy from uh, the 1920s through to the 2020s. Uh, this is the third show in this, uh, in this series. The first two focused on American domestic politics. Uh, first one was with Adam Hothschild um, about America during the First World War, its labor issues and political issues. And the second with Amity Schles, the biographer of Calvin Coolidge, uh, who provided us with an analysis of politics in the 1920s domestically in the United States. We're going to look outward today in this third uh, show in the series. Uh, with one of America's uh, authorities on foreign policy, one of America's leading historians, indeed, of America's role in the world. Uh, Robert Kagan works at uh, the Brookings Institute. And he has a new book out, uh, The Ghost at the Feast, America and the Collapse of the World Order, 1900 to 1941. It's a wonderful book, and I'm thrilled that uh, Robert Kagan is joining us in person, in real life. Uh, uh, Bob, uh, Bob Kagan, um, we've talked internally about American democracy in the 1920s. So two questions to begin. Firstly, how did the rest of the world, and these are broad questions, so maybe we'll get into them in some detail. How did the rest of the world think of American democracy in the 1920s, firstly, and secondly, how did Americans think of themselves in the international community of democracy around the world? Perhaps we might um, begin with the view from the outside in the 1920s of American democracy. Well, in the 1920s, of course, we were the, the world was still recovering from World War I and, and trying to put itself back together, which was not an easy thing to do. And, and, and most countries at that time, I don't know what, so much what they thought about the United States internally, not, we can get into that, but for them, the United States was, was, was the answer. Uh, one of the striking things as you look at Europe in the 1920s is that every single major power, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, others, uh, were entirely dependent on American financing and were desperate for the United States to play a larger role in Europe than Americans wanted to play. And I think, you know, some of that was, uh, was a consequence of the way they viewed America. I think they had a fundamentally benevolent view of America's role in the world, but, uh, but they saw American democracy as vital to their own interests, I think. And that, that, that was a big part of international relations at that time. And then the second part of the question, how did Americans, and I know it's, it's, there are different Americans with different opinions, but how did America think of itself within this evolving community, this growing community of democracies around the world? Right, and basically most Americans wanted nothing to do with it. I mean, as much as the, as much as the Europeans were hoping that the United States would, would get more involved in Europe, the American people wanted to have nothing to do with Europe. For a variety of complicated reasons, Americans were very disillusioned with their experience in World War I, not just the losses of soldiers, but also the way the war ended, the way the peace came out. Uh, obviously, the Americans voted against the League of Nations and did not participate in the Versailles Treaty. So the general view of Americans was that the less they had to do with Europe, the better. To the point where American diplomats were instructed not to attend European events in an official capacity for some portion of the 1920s. How much, in your view, did the Wilson, and maybe this is the wrong way to describe it, you'll correct me, uh, the, the Wilson debacle at Versailles, how much do you think it affected both uh, 
the view around the world of America and indeed American politics, domestic politics in the 1920s? Well, it depends what you mean by the debacle. I don't, I don't well, think... Well, his failure, to, firstly, to get... his, his failure to get the kind of treaty that he wanted and, of course, to sell it to the American people. Well, on the first part, I think he did generally get the treaty that he wanted. And I, I, my, my view, and I, I go into this in some detail in the book, is that the Versailles Treaty has gotten a bad rap. People blame the treaty for the breakdown of the peace. But the vital element of the treaty was supposed to be the American role. The treaty was built around the United States. The United States was going to be chairman of all kinds of relevant commissions. And when the United States pulled out or didn't ratify the treaty and pulled out of Europe entirely, it was like pulling the main tent pole out of the tent. Uh, Versailles could never work without the United States. So, uh, you know, the, the debacle is the political problem in the United States. And that's a complicated story. Um, you know, Wilson was not an adept president in that instance, but it wasn't because he wasn't an adept president. He'd actually been a very effective president. Um, it was the determination of the Republicans who would then controlled Congress to defeat Wilson on this most important uh, bit of his, you know, his presidency in order to take back the White House in 1920. That drove everything. And that was more important than even the foreign policy debate, ultimately. And in terms of its impact on the 20s, I mean, how is it perceived? I, I take your point that maybe Wilson pretty much got what he wanted at Versailles, but it wasn't seen that way, was it? No, it wasn't seen that way because people had very unrealistic expectations about what a treaty could look like. The fact, that, the fact that Wilson had to bargain with the other great powers rather than simply order the entire world what to do so people didn't like the compromises that were made. And some of the compromises were very unfortunate. For instance, the Japanese holding on to Chinese territory after the Germans uh, were forced to evacuate. So there were certainly flaws in the treaty, but at the heart of the treaty was trying to solve the Franco-German problem and the treaty was aimed at doing that and might have successfully done that as I say if the Americans uh, had remained involved. Was there such a thing Bob as Wilsonianism as an ideology as a way for America to think about not just the world but its role in the world? I think we make a mistake in personalizing it because Wilson wasn't the only one who thought the United States had an important role to play. He was not even the first to come up with the idea of a League of Nations. Believe it or not, that was Theodore Roosevelt uh, who wrote a, a series of essays outlining the idea of a League in early 1914, at, early in the war. Um, and so what Wilson did, I think, reflected uh, at least one American view of how the United States should engage in the world. But there was a competing view, and the competing view ultimately triumphed, as I say, largely for reasons of domestic politics, but also because it reflected a, a truism about Americans, which is, historically, they have never really felt that it was necessary for them to get involved in the world. Um, and so they have generally felt that only in the most extreme circumstances should they get involved. And uh, well, that led to you know, the creation of those extreme circumstances later in the 1930s. But that was the mood in the 20s. You asked me about the Republican Party, and I do think it's worth saying, the Republican Party was the internationalist party uh, before World War I. Wilson represented the isolationist party. The Democrats were historically the isolationists. The, the two parties, as sometimes happens, and even has happened more recently, sometimes flip places. And so Wilson became the internationalist, and the Republicans, almost in reaction, uh, turned away from their own internationalism and started selling a more isolationist policy, which then dominated Republican foreign policy uh, throughout the 1920s and until the election of Franklin Roosevelt. So it seemed to me a, a sort of curious irony, in some ways rather troubling, that you have a man like Wilson who was such an internationalist and yet has been strongly criticized, rightly in my opinion, maybe you'll correct me, on his policy, for example, towards African Americans and uh, the whole issue of race. Whereas Republicans may have been isolationists, but were more perhaps open-minded on, on some domestic issues. Do you see, as a historian of foreign policy, synergies or between how you think of issues domestically and internationally um, in terms of rights and responsibilities? 
there's a there's a clear connection between uh, a, a party or a movement's orientation domestically and their foreign policy. So generally, the more, uh, let's just say, progressive of the two parties is generally has a more active foreign policy because a progressive foreign policy is, is, is based on expanding rights, defending rights. It's a, it's a more ideological approach, whereas a conservative policy is usually about keeping things as they are. And so that emphasis on rights domestically does have an impact. So, you know, the Republican Party, and this is important to remember, especially when talking about what Wilson was or wasn't in, in that period, you have to remember the Civil War was still alive as a, as a major factor in the way people thought about the United States at that time. It still is. And, 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 and still is, absolutely. People underestimate the influence of the Civil War to even today, but certainly then. And the Democratic Party, after all, was the party that supported the South. Uh, and the Republican Party was formed in opposition to slavery, it was exclusively a northern party. And so Republicans were the moral party. They were the moralistic party from the Civil War uh, until World War I. And the Democrats tended to be the states' rights party, the conservative party. And so Wilson's uh, racism, which I'm sure also came naturally to him given where he was born, but it also reflected what his party was. Uh, Republicans tended to be the ones who were calling for r rights for African Americans in that period, and Democrats who were dominated still by the South were defending Jim Crow. And so, and that had an impact. Now, the interesting thing, of course, that in foreign policy, Wilson was the progressive, and in many domestic areas on economic issues, he was also a progressive, and the Republicans then became the conservatives and the isolationists and became the Republican Party that we knew in the 1920s, the party of Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover. Um, and their foreign policy was of a piece with that. Conservative domestically, uh, limited in foreign policy. It's ironic that one could be anti-colonial in foreign policy and yet critical, perhaps, of reconstruction in the United States. Right, right. Well, you know, the South's view uh, was that they were a colonized, defeated power. Uh, they were the victims of America's liberal hegemony. They were the first victims of America's liberal hegemony. In fact, C. Van Woodward, the great uh, Southern historian, wrote a lot about how the South had a unique experience in American history because Americans in general had no uh, history of being occupied and defeated. The South was occupied and defeated uh, by a foreign army. And that had a big impact on Southern attitudes towards foreign policy for a while. And then that changed as the circumstances changed over the years. Talking about American progressives, William Jennings Bryant, maybe Roosevelt, was, were people like Bryant, they seem not very embracing of the world. Were they internationalists? Yeah, strikingly enough, Brian was. In fact, I quote him at some length, uh, even in the late 19th century, talking about, he had a very, as you might expect, he was generally a pacifist in terms of, of in, in, on that, uh, in terms of the use of power, but he wanted the United States to play a role, not only as a moral example, but actually to take part in furthering moral causes. Brian was one of the leading supporters of the Spanish, of the intervention in Cuba, which led to the Spanish-American War. He saw it as a moral cause. And interestingly, as Secretary of State, of course, as Wilson's Secretary of State, he, in, he was as interventionist in the Western Hemisphere as his predecessors. Um, so, in, in fact, he was in some respects more interventionist. So it's a complicated story when it comes to, to someone like Brian. Now, it's true that some of the progressive Republicans, like William Bora and Hiram Johnson, they were isolationists. Uh, West progressives, Western America, was a different, you know, the regional aspect of this is also vitally important because the East in general tended to be more internationalist and the, and the, and the farther you went out past the Appalachians, uh, the more isolationist you found Americans becoming. Uh, and Jennings is a complicated character because of course he figures his last great act and he lasted a long time on the stage of American history was at the Scopes trial. Right where he was arguing against the idea of scientific evolutionism. Yeah. So how does that all fit in in a, in a cultural sense? Because, of course, the 1920s was an enormously 
turbulent period in terms of culture, theories of science and all that sort of thing? Well, that's the, you know, that is one of the complex elements of, of, of William Jennings Bryan, but, and also what he represented, which is that we refer to him as a progressive. I think he would have been known, he was known more as a populist. And he certainly was the leader of the populist party when it was formed. And he was a, he was a leader of the populist movement in the 1890s. And that populism has uh, in it a deep conservatism. And, and what we saw in right. the 1920s is, uh, you know, because we're really talking about what they used to call prairie populism, but which is to say a populism that wanted more economic rights, but, but had a rather conservative view of cultural issues. The 1920s are very similar to the period that we're in right now in terms of the, uh, the, the backlash against internationalism, progressivism, immigration, uh, racial issues. Mm. It was really a backlash and to some extent against modernity uh, and what was happening to the United States as a result of the Industrial Revolution and the, the decline of farming, etc. And, it, and, and so what do you see in the 1920s? The rise of the Klan to unprecedented heights, uh, the most restrictive anti-immigration legislation in American history, trade protectionism. Prohibition, uh, of course, as prohibition, well. Prohibition, which is a very conservative and actually anti-Catholic, uh, you know, there's a lot of, the, the, a lot of these strains that we see popping up here and there now were very visible in the 1920s. The only difference, between the 1920 election and the 2016 election is that one elected Warren Harding and one elected Donald Trump. But the, but the movements behind both elections, I think, were very similar. Prohibition is uniquely American. What isn't uniquely American is the socialist movement, working class socialist movement. We talked about Debs. How do you make sense of Debs within this complicated tapestry? Republicans, Democrats, progressives, and then Debs, who was a, a relatively conventional socialist, wasn't he? Right. And, you know, as, as I'm sure people know, one of the consequences of World War I, which coincided with the Bolshevik Revolution, was an incredible panic about the possibility that communists or socialists... That most Americans didn't make a distinction, really. And by the way, I feel like they don't make that distinction today either between socialism and communism. And so socialists were regarded essentially as, as Bolsheviks. Um, and there was tremendous prejudice against them. And because they were anti-war, as socialists tended to be uh, in most countries, uh, they were therefore accused of being anti-American and, and basically engaged in treason. Uh, which is why, you know, Debs was thrown in jail for opposing the war and other socialists were kicked out of office. Um, uh, there was a famous uh, socialist in Milwaukee named Victor Berger who was, uh, who was kicked out of office because he was a socialist. I mean, there were, this prejudice ran very deep uh, because... And there were, as, as that Adam Hothschild shows in his book, there were I don't know if this is the right word, lynchings of, of socialists of one kind or another throughout the First World War. Right, and you know, there was also great fear of anarchists at the time. And there, you know, it's worth remembering that the so-called Red Scare did originate with a series of, of very frightening bombings uh, of, of major political, fig of major figures, uh, everybody from, you know, Justice Holmes, uh, to the governor of New York, uh, you know, uh, received bomb packages at their homes. And this led to a great hysteria. Uh, and J. Edgar Hoover as well. And this, this led to the birth of J. Edgar Hoover, as, as, as Beverly Gage has written. So, um, you know, it, it, it was quite a... The period 1918-1919 is, is a really... In a way, it makes our present moment seem rather tame, I'd say. Yeah, well, Adam Hothschild uh, spoke wonderfully about that. Yeah. Um, Debs, of course, saw the world in terms of working class solidarity, both within and outside America. Uh, American historians like Thomas Frank have looked back rather nostalgically in the pre-First World War period in particular, in the way in which blacks and whites, for example, united on populist platforms. Did that play itself out, do you think, in the socialist movement in terms of the way of looking at the world and an attempt to unite people of different skins and ethnicities and religions within America itself? 
You know, I don't want to pretend to be such an expert on that particular strain of what was going on in that period, but I would say certainly by the 1930s, you see that uh, that alliance has, has clearly formed, and you see African Americans and socialists and communists and others uh, trying to create a, you know, a real reform, a real reform movement, and that that then you know, ultimately becomes the civil rights movement of the 1960s. But, but I think you're right to, to point out that that was happening then. Whether it was happening in the, during World War I, I'm, le it's, I'm less uh, clear on that. I think most people tend to think that if you're open to the world, it generates a lot of cultural energy and, and, and vitality. But one of the odd things about America in the 1920s is, as you suggested, on the one hand, it was a country that cut itself off from the world. Isolationism was the dominant ideology, both on the left and the right. And yet it was also a time of enormous cultural energy, of great writing and music making, uh, and, and, and general color and energy, a time of the jazz age and of young people. How, do that, how does that all go together? Why, why was America, on the one hand, domestically so vibrant and yet cut itself off from the rest of the world? Well, you know, it's by the way, it's an exaggeration to say they completely cut themselves off no, from the I rest understand. of the world. Because, and but this is, but this sort of gets to your point. After all, a lot of that writing that you're talking about was being done by expatriates living in France right. or, or elsewhere. You know, the Hemingways and the Fitzgeralds, etc. Uh, they lived in a very cosmopolitan world, uh, which is interesting because then they became famous as American writers. But America itself at that time was not very, co most of America was not very cosmopolitan. So you really had a divided, you really had a divided country, which I think is why you saw all that reaction in the 1920s. You know, you, on the one hand, you have, you have a lot of avant-garde thinking, you know, a lot of things that are happening in Weimar Germany are coming over to the United States. It's, it's a very fertile period for the United States. Arti as you say, artistically and culturally, it's a, it's a much deeper involvement with the European scene than you'd had before. And yet at the same time, you have the Klan and the anti-immigration legislation, etc. And internationalism has been made a dirty word. I mean, one of the things that the Republicans did successfully, Henry Cabot Lodge and others, uh, in equating internationalism with Bolshevism. And so what you had is a conflicted country, and it reflected itself in, I think, some of the extremes uh, that of the of the movement, you know, we again we tend to look back on the twenties as you say the jazz age, etc. But is that you know that's not even half the story, obviously, because the other thing that's happening is this incredible conservative reaction, which continues until the Great Depression, and then the cards are all thrown up in the air again. So these, as you suggest, the bookends between Wilson and FDR are three. Republican presidents, yep. Harding, Coolidge, and then Hoover. Did they, three of them, pursue a relatively consistent foreign policy and view of the world? I always thought of Hoover as somewhat more open-minded than Coolidge, or is that a mistake? Everybody was more open-minded than Coolidge, but, <laughs> yeah, but yes. I mean, Hoover, uh, Hoover is an interesting character because, of course, Hoover was the original internationalist. Um, you know, he made back his, in Belgium, right? He made his name feeding, the, you know, with Belgian relief. He also made his name with relief with the Russian famine. Um, he he really was, uh, and, and he believed very much in sort of a technocratic way of organizing the world. But of course, if you wanted to be president and get nominated in the Republican Party in this period, you had to you had to shelve all that. So as president. Uh, Hoover was as much of an isolationist as anyone, and in fact, on the, on the one issue that he had to confront, uh, which was the Japanese invasion of Manchuria, um, he didn't want to do anything at all. He had a Secretary of State, Henry Stimson, who was pushing to do something to try to get the Japanese to, to, to contain themselves and, and to try to prevent them from conquering all of China, and Hoover wanted no part of it. Um, so. Uh, you know, whatever he meant, whatever his personal feelings may once have been he, as president and as the party leader of a party that had chosen isolationism, that was the foreign policy that he pursued. By the way, that was where the country was to the point where even Franklin Roosevelt, who was certainly an internationalist, you might even say a Wilsonian internationalist, in his first term behaved exactly the same. Uh, as Hoover. I mean, it's Although, a, to be fair to FDR, he, he didn't, borrowing your language, the ghost of the feast, he, 
He, he didn't have the ghost of racism in his political artillery, did he? No, no. I would say he's one, he was one of the most liberal-minded presidents that we, that we certainly had had up until that point. But, but you know, nevertheless, and I, I just want to say, we, we, we do tend to overemphasize the significance of a president. Now, a president has obviously got enormous power, but I have, re I have seen very few presidents who, especially on foreign policy, were prepared to go beyond where they thought the dead center of American public opinion was. Presidents are very reluctant to get out of ahead of a public opinion. You could see that today, by the way. Um, but you could certainly see it in the case of FDR. Uh, his whole presidency is about trying to bring the people slowly forward to where he was and not always being able to succeed and therefore having to himself pull back. You've already noted there are lots of similarities between the 1920s and the 2020s. There's one difference, Bob, that when it comes to foreign policy that individuals within Congress, within the Senate in particular, were far more influential and powerful. You've already uh, mentioned Cabot Lodge. He was enormously influential within the Republican Party throughout much of the 20s. Uh, were senators more powerful in shaping American foreign policy? Absolutely. In fact, in the 20s, the Senate dominated foreign policy. Um, uh, Bor First Lodge was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, then William Borah was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and, and the secretaries of state during that period wouldn't make a move without, without making sure that Borah was on board, and uh, so he was really in control. By the way, that is the norm in American history up until World War II, basically, and maybe even to some extent afterwards, but definitely World War II is a dividing point. Congress uh, has much more power in foreign policy prior to World War II than it, than it would afterwards. Now, I think that probably has a lot to do with the fact that the American role becomes so extensive that it becomes impossible for Congress in a way to micromanage it and power naturally flows uh, to the executive and we start talking about the imperial presidency at that point. But, but yes, a senator, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee chairman was, uh, was often more influential than the Secretary of State in that period. Subtitle of The Ghost of the Peace, Bob, is America and the Collapse of the World Order, 1900 to 1941. We're focusing on the 1920s. In your view, what was American responsibility in, in the crisis of the world order that became increasingly self-evident by the end of the 1920s? I mean, basically what happened was uh, up until World War I, but I would say up until the beginning of the 20th century in general, there was a world order that was essentially run by Great Britain. Britain mastered the seas, kept the seas open. There was, it was a relatively speaking global free trade. A lot of the things that we talk about, that we talked about in the 1990s about globalization, the communications revolution, financial revolution, etc. All of that was taking place under the umbrella of British naval power. Uh, with, uh, uh, made possible in addition by the fact that on the European continent there was a rough balance of power until the unification of Germany. But beginning in 19, you know, by the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century, that order is collapsing because Britain does not have the power anymore to deal with, on the one hand, a rising Germany in Europe, and just as importantly, a rising great power in East Asia, in, the, in, the, in, in Japan. Because in that entire period, what had been the dominant power in East Asia was China, had been completely decimated and was being carved up by the various European empires. But the rise of Japan is something new. So that order is no longer capable of being sustained. And the moment of that, then when that becomes obvious, is World War I. And then the question is, so then is there going to be an order? And if so, how is it going to be sustained? And it became very clear to everyone at that time that the only power capable of sustaining that order was the United States. Um, and so Americans had a choice. If they wanted to continue living in a liberal world order, they were going to have to do it themselves. Otherwise, they could let the world go in its own place and they would live with the consequences. They chose the first option, the second option of letting things go where they will. And then as things uh, in the 1930s, as the fascists start going, then Americans realize it, if it isn't going to be them, it's going to be no one. And so that's really it. It isn't so much a responsibility that Americans sought. 
It was really a question that came to them as a result of a reconfiguration of power in the international system, which placed the United States at the center. And of course, people didn't understand that in the 20s, did they? America was... I don't think people understand that now. But certainly in the 20s, where the, the, the reconstructed Europe was built on American economics on American wealth. Was, was that understood in America? Oh, sure. And, you know, Americans were very proud of the so-called Dawes Plan, which was the way that uh, American loans wound up uh, financing Germany so that Germany could pay its reparations to France and Britain, so that France and Britain could pay their war debts to the United yeah. States, that whole, that whole thing. But everybody, and, but the Dawes himself was, became a great national hero. He was made the vice presidential candidate uh, under Coolidge. And, um, and so Americans were, were perfectly aware and were actually very proud of what they regarded as their ability to keep their distance and keep things cool just by using their financial leverage. And that was, that was the goal at the time. But unfortunately, uh, financial leverage only takes you so far when other countries start bringing out the guns. And then it's a question of what are you going to do about that? If Eugene Debs was here, unfortunately he's not, he might point in the 1920s to America emerging as the, the, the heart of the, the global capitalist system. Uh, you're not Debsian, you're not a socialist or, or, or even politically on the left. Is there any truth to that? I mean, how did America fit into this evolving global capitalist system? No, I mean, it, it's certainly the case that America became the heart of the global capitalist system and capitalism came to reflect American preferences, too. Uh, and that, that was more true after World War II in the settlement because that was also when the United States essentially took economic power sort of definitively away from Great Britain. In the 1920s, uh, New York is now the financial capital of the world, but London is still a financial capital of the world and you really have a kind of balance. And, and what was happening in that period was you had the, the central bankers of the, key, of the key countries, basically the United States, Britain and France, uh, sort of trying to work everything out together as best they could. Um, but that era is over by the end of World War II, and then really the United States is the dominant power uh, economically. But, but I think insofar, as, but there's no question that America was the heart of the capitalist, of the capitalist order, and that Americans, you know, fought to preserve that capitalist order. It wasn't, you know, when you say Americans fought for democracy and liberalism, well, they were fighting from all of this. I mean, they were fighting for a capitalist system from which they benefit, or at least was, was the system that, that, that they lived in. And, and that's a big part of the American hegemony as well. It's a capital, it is a capitalist hegemony. You mentioned that we, or Americans, fought for democracy, and democracy was used in terms of justification justification in first and the second world war the odd thing about the 20s it seems to me is on the one hand you had a time of enormous change of so much color and yet the political system didn't change much we had rather conservative presidents uh, there wasn't that much drama domestically in american politics in the 1920s was there no no because look uh, I think it was Fiorello LaGuardia said, it's hard to be a reformer when things are good. And the fact is, is that even though there was a brief recession after World War I as a result of adjusting to the end of the orders from Europe, the United States economy took off like no one had ever seen before in this period. And in, in times of, of, of plenty, uh, you don't get a lot of change and reform. It's usually in times of crisis that you get uh, change and reform. And of course, the 1920s were followed by the 1930s in which there was massive uh, uh, reform because if you look at it this way, the period of World War I was a, was a highly progressive period. The 20s were a conservative reaction against the progressive period. And in some respects, the 1930s were a progressive reaction against the conservative period. And, and so, you know, we, we see this kind of bouncing back and forth uh, as, as I think, as I suppose you could say in a sort of uh, general sense, Americans looking for the right balance. But in any case, there is a general tendency to kind of swing back and forth. And again, not to be uh, 
presentist, but that kind of thing has been happening now too. A long period of progressive reform has been followed by conservative reaction. It's not, it's not that unusual. The question is how far does the conservative reaction go? In a, uh, that's, and, and we don't know the answer to that right now. Bob, we associate the 30s with the rise of Hitler and Nazism. Uh, and of course with Joseph Stalin in Russia, the two sort of monsters of totalitarianism. But it all began in the 20s with the rise of Mussolini. One of the things that strikes me about Amity Schles's book about Coolidge, for example, is I'm not even sure if Coolidge knew who Mussolini was, or at least in her presentation, he doesn't seem to have had any interest in the outside world. Was there any, anyone in America in the 1920s who understood the rise of a populist like Mussolini and the dark clouds on the horizon. Mussolini was a was something of a kind of hero in the United States in the 1920s. Um, you know, this is what as it, a modernist as well as as a modernizer, as someone there was tremendous sort of general contempt for the sort of it, Italian sort of peasant economy, and and people thought that uh, that people wrote in fact that Mussolini was exactly what Italy needed. Um, uh, for instance, Will Rogers wrote, you know, he said, dictator government is the best form of government if you have the right dictator, and the Italians do. Uh, and, and this was a very common view because he was modernizing Italy uh, in that way. Um, and, you know, Forbes magazine would run uh, all kinds of uh, stories about him from a business point of view. Business, American businessmen were fascinated by Mussolini. So it really isn't until the 1930s um, that, that Mussolini takes on this darker characteristic that you're talking about. And the odd thing about the 20s as well is nothing in a sense in Europe changed. I mean, the European powers continued outside Germany, continued to be colonial. British ruled India, the Dutch and the French uh, had huge territories in, in Asia and Africa. Um, were Americans aware of that? Was there much anti-colonial feeling in America in the 20s? Oh, sure. And, and one of the complaints about the Versailles Treaty that, that critics brought up, I don't think this was Wilson's problem particularly, was that it was a treaty designed to serve the imperial powers. And people were very, you know, pointing to the way Britain and France divided up the Ottoman Empire uh, in the Sykes-Picot Treaty. And uh, I already, we already mentioned about Japan uh, holding on to a part of China that Germany had, had taken. Um, and so Americans were, they basic, when they wanted to turn against Europe, uh, the argument for turning against Europe was empire, uh, the British Empire, the French Empire. Uh, that was a very, actually a very powerful sentiment in the United States. They were, Americans were aware. It, it, it's always a mistake at any time in, in, hist in American history to say that Americans were completely unaware of what's happening around the world. They weren't. I could, there, you could point to any number of instances where Americans got very fired up about things that were going on in the world. The Armenian Genocide of the 1890s, for instance, um, ca captured, uh, you know, was headlines across the nation. So Americans were aware of what was going on. The problem was not awareness. The, the problem, if it was a problem, was they were aware and they definitely did not want to have anything to do with it. That continues in the 1930s. You've been uh, a, a wonderful guest on how to fix democracy. Uh, Bob, uh, I think I've worn you out, but a final question. You are a scholar of foreign policy, one of America's leading, uh, enormously authoritative. This is the second volume in, your, in, a, in a three part uh, series on American foreign policy. Uh, but you're, of course, also profoundly, as you've shown in this conversation, profoundly interested in American domestic politics. What particular insights do you think foreign policy experts like yourself bring? to the domestic spheres, particularly when it comes to American democracy, that perhaps domestic experts might miss? Uh, well, I don't, I, don't know. I don't know that I have uh, any... Not you personally, but your, your discipline. What, what, what do you bring? What perspective that is useful? We, you're actually the first authority on foreign policy that we've really had on how to fix democracy. 
Well, I, I think if there's, any, uh, if there's anything, it would just be the ability to make comparisons. I mean, the ability to see the United States in context. Uh, you know, it's very easy for Americans to think about America, judge America against America, judge America against American ideals. That's a big part of what we do. Uh, we don't necessarily judge America compared to others. We don't think that their experiences are necessarily relevant to ours. So the only thing about it, having a, you know, having a broader knowledge of, of world affairs is that you can put America in its, in its context rather than seeing it as a kind of disembodied uh, entity. America is a, are a people like other people with problems like other people, but also great differences from the way other peoples live based on geography, uh, ideology, uh, etc. Et all right, Bob, uh, Robert Kagan, I want to thank you for contextualizing American foreign policy, American domestic politics, and the American people in the context of the 1920s. Thank you so much. It's a real honor to have you on How to Fix Democracy. Thank you.